For anyone familiar with the language, we all know that English has a lot of oddities to it. So we're going to try and go through some of those and clear these up today so that when we face them, we can symbolize them effectively. The first one that we're going to look at is the sort of ambiguous nature of English. Now, there's a lot of ways that English can be ambiguous, uh, but I'm not going to sort of focus on some of the sort of like more famous funny examples. An ambiguous sentence is when the meaning is unclear, but I'm going to mean that in a very specific way. So here's an example of an ambiguous sentence. It is not the case that Keegan passes if he doesn't study. So a sentence is ambiguous for our purposes uh, if there are at least two logical connectives that could be the main connective. So if you look back at the sentence, uh, I'm suggesting here that there's multiple ways of interpreting it under which there's a different main connective. And you wouldn't really be wrong either way, and that's what makes it ambiguous. So typically, this is caused by a lack of punctuation. So we'll look at that as we sort of decipher this. So let's take a closer look at the sentence. There's three connectives here. Two of them are negations, which we remember are unary connectives. They just modify one thing. And the other connective is the conditional, if then. So if we look at the end of the sentence where it says he doesn't study, uh, that's not really that complicated. The doesn't is clearly just modifying the study. Uh, which is uh, the atomic letter S. So we know that there's some sort of negation S, no problem. What is ambiguous is what the first negation is modifying. Is the first negation modifying uh, the atomic Keegan passes? Or is it actually modifying the sort of logical nature of the conditional? Is it modifying the if? And it's a bit unclear. So let's look at it both ways. Let's first look and see what happens if we try and symbolize it where the negation is just modifying the atomic Keegan passes. Uh, well, that's pretty straightforward. That means that the conditional is the main connective, uh, and we know he doesn't study is the antecedent, and he doesn't pass, or Keegan doesn't pass, is the consequent, and we get the symbolization in number one. Uh, if we switch and we consider the case that the negation is actually modifying the conditional, well then what we get is that the conditional cannot be the main connective because it's being modified by something else. So the negation has to be the main connective here, and we get a different symbolization. We have to make sure the negation is the main connective and it is modifying the uh, conditional, and uh, if you're sort of uh, rough, rusty on this, you can just look back at some of the syntax stuff that we learned in Unit 2. Uh, but then we get this natural symbolization. The negation S is still the antecedent of the, con of the conditional, but it's just P is the uh, consequent, and the negation isn't modifying the P, it's actually modifying the entire conditional. So these are two different symbolizations, and you might just ask, are these logically equivalent? Uh, well, we can prove that they're not pretty straightforward by doing a truth table. I'm not actually going to walk through this, but if you do the truth table, you'll immediately see that they're not logically equivalent, which means that there are two genuinely unique and different symbolizations and ways of understanding that sentence. And so that's why that sentence is ambiguous. There are lots of examples of ambiguity that we can sort of come up with. Here are just some sort of more common examples uh, that we'll walk through pretty quickly. So the first one is if I say P or Q and S, well, there are two ways of understanding this. Am I saying P or Q and S, or am I saying P or Q and S? And once you sort of write it out in this way, symbolizing each of them is very straightforward. Similarly, if I say if P then Q and R, Am I saying if P then Q and R? Or am I saying if P then Q and R? Now notice in all these cases that I'm disambiguating these statements, uh, I've used commas. I've inserted uh, some punctuation to sort of help me out. But sometimes English doesn't really allow for punctuation to really help things out. And here's an example. If I say not P and Q, am I saying not P and Q? Or am I saying not P? and Q. And there's no real sort of like comma that can sort of help me out here. So in this case, the, the language might seem ambiguous. Um, I would never sort of deliberately try and trick you with something like this. Uh, so that's why I've always been using the phrase not both when I'm trying to modify the entire thing. Uh, so for me, if I say not both P and Q, that would mean that the not is the primary connective. And for me, if I said not P and Q, the not is attached to the P only, but you can see how this could be misleading and ambiguous. One thing in English that can help clarify ambiguity is the semicolon, which we haven't really talked about in any example prior. But the semicolon essentially acts like an indicator 
that this connective is the dominant connective. It's the main connective. And normally, the main connective associated with a semicolon is a conjunction. So here I have P or Q semicolon, but X or Y. And uh, that sort of semicolon conjunction is going to be the main connective. Uh, and we can just symbolize this very straightforward from there. We just get P or Q and X or Y, and there's no ambiguity. But keep in mind, this doesn't solve all our problems, because in this example, P, Q, or R, semicolon. However, if X, then Y, and Z, uh, it's true, the semicolon does tell me what the main connective of this statement is, uh, and that's the AND, and then I can symbolize the P, Q, or R very easily. But unfortunately, the right side is ambiguous. It's ambiguous uh, just like the previous example I had on the other slide. Uh, and so it's actually unclear which is the right answer here. So ambiguous sentences are a bit annoying. You can clarify them with commas. Uh, in general, though, I would never ask you something ambiguous without telling you that it's ambiguous. So I'm not trying to trick or mislead. But these are just helpful skills because a lot of the time in written language, uh, or even in spoken language of English, it is a bit unclear. And knowing why it's unclear can help you sort of ask the right questions to figure out what the real meaning is. Here's another oddity of English that confounds a lot of people. What's the difference between these two statements? Cats that scratch terrify me, and cats which scratch terrify me. Now notice that there's a comma there, so I had a natural pause when I read it. But other than sort of my intonations, what is the actual difference here? What is the meaning difference? It turns out the meaning difference is something called a restrictive clause versus a non-restrictive clause. So a restrictive clause is when we use the word that. So it was in the first example. Cats that scratch are terrifying. So if I say that, it's a restricted subject compared to all cats. So what I mean is I'm actually just making a claim about cats that happen to scratch as well, not about all cats. Whereas a non-restrictive clause, which was the case in the which example, uh, this is actually a non-restricted claim. It's a claim about all cats. So let's look back at these examples. Cats that scratch terrify me. Cats which scratch terrify me. There's an easy way to differentiate the meaning between these two. I could ask, is it possible that there are non-scratching cats? Is it possible that there are cats that just actually don't scratch? And in the top sentence, the answer is yes. It turns out that that is perfectly possible. I'm just not talking about those cats. I don't know anything about those cats according to this st statement. They might terrify me. They might not. It doesn't matter. What I'm talking about are only about those cats that also scratch. But the second sentence denies this. Is it possible for non-scratching cats to exist if I say cats, which scratch, terrify me? The answer is no. I'm actually asserting something about all cats, and all cats actually scratch. Now, there is sort of like this philosophical question, I guess, that we could follow up with. Are there non-scratching cats? And it turns out that this is um, uh, sort of a strange question. Uh, you might think that in the first case, it would imply that there are non-scratching cats, and in the second, there aren't. But in fact, that's not quite right. If I say the non-restricted -rest case, it is true that there are no such things as non-scratching cats. But in the restricted case, the cats that scratch uh, terrify me, uh, I'm actually not even asserting that there are cats that don't scratch. Now, if this seems a bit unclear, it's because it is. And we're actually not really well equipped to tackle this case until we add more to our logical sort of apparatus. And we'll be doing that uh, a little down the road in Unit 5. So what you need to know now is that restrictive clauses are talking about some sort of subset of the main group, right? I'm not talking about all the cats. I'm talking about the cats that scratch. And non-restrictive clauses are making some sort of additional claim about the main group. Uh, and if I make an additional claim, I will use a conjunction to help me symbolize. So if I say dogs, who are cuddly, make great pets, really I'm saying two things. One thing I'm saying is dogs make great pets. And the other thing I'm saying is dogs are cuddly. And so that just symbolizes very straightforward as P and Q. So remember, non-restrictive clause symbolization, use a conjunction, and just read off the separate sort of cases or assertions that we're making. There is a warning that I want to put out there. Uh, here's an example. I could say philosophy, which is interesting, is fun, versus philosophy, which is interesting, is fun. And you might think that the top one has to be restrictive and the bottom one has to be non-restrictive. Uh, and you might be right. And the reason why is because I have these commas, and the commas are important. 
However, I just don't really like this. Uh, if you actually type this into a program like Microsoft Word, it'll give you the sort of squiggly underline on the first sentence, uh, and it'll say that that's grammatically incorrect. And I'm going to actually just agree with that. There's something wrong with the phrasing of the first uh, sentence without the commas uh, that is misleading. It's, um, it's somewhat misleading whether or not you meant to say restricted or non-restricted. So for my purposes, I'm just going to say those sentences shouldn't be. We're not going to worry about sort of these non-grammatically correct sentences. So non-restrictive clauses then we can identify by the words which, but unfortunately also who, whom, and whose depending on what we're talking about. And restrictive clauses, we can identify uh, with the word that, and unfortunately also who, whom, and whose. This is an oddity of English. Uh, but what we're really going to be looking for to help us distinguish this is the commas. When we see the commas, so it's comma which, comma who, comma whom, comma whose, then we know we're talking about a non-restrictive case. And this is just a really good habit to incorporate in your own sort of writing uh, moving forward, so you'll never sort of have cases where it's unclear what you meant. The last thing we're going to look at are reference phrases or reference uh, identifiers. Uh, so here's a pretty straightforward example. If I say P, Q, and R, but if the first happens, then Z, well, what do I mean by the first? Well, I hope that's actually just sort of pretty obvious. I listed three possibilities, P, Q, and R, and the first just means the first one. So symbolizing this is pretty straightforward. You just have to be careful about what the antecedent is, what the consequent is, et cetera, et cetera. Notice I have a semicolon, so uh, I know what the main connective is. It's the conjunction. And so I know that the first condition is P, so that's why I finish with P arrow Z. Similarly, if I said this, if the second happens or the third happens, I get the same sort of very natural symbolizations, but I pick out Q or I pick out R. So when I have these sort of reference uh, callouts, uh, if they're numbered or, or sort of like ordered in this way, it's very straightforward. English has some other ways of referring to things in sequence. I could say the former or the latter, and that's also reasonably straightforward. The former is the first thing I said, and so in that case, that's the P, and the latter is the last thing I said, and in this case, it's the Q. Uh, it's sort of a convention that we only say former and latter when there are two options, but that's not like strictly necessary. I could, if I wanted, state like, a, a list of like six possibilities and say former and that would be the first and latter is the last. Um, I, I don't know, I guess that's a bit awkward, but um, that's perfectly possible. So here's a symbolization with the latter. In this last example, this is sort of where things can be seemingly confusing, but I'm going to try and spell it out so it's not. I'll feel better if I take a nap, and in that case, I'll go for a walk. Now you can see the symbolization of this is going to be very straightforward, except for one thing. So uh, we have the conditional P arrow Q, and then I also need to symbolize and in that case, R. But and is no problem, that's just conjunction. The only question is, how do I symbolize in that case? What does that actually mean? Well, it really means if something happens, then R will occur. That's what it means. So I know that I have a conditional in, in the sort of general form here. What I don't know is I don't know what in that case means. Which case am I talking about? What should actually go where that question mark is right now? I hope you see that we only have three possibilities here. It's Q arrow R, or it's P arrow R, or it's P arrow Q arrow R. So it's one of the conditions, the other condition, or it's the full sort of uh, P arrow Q, I'll feel better if I take a nap clause that can go in as my in that case. And this can be confusing about what the correct reference is of that sort of pointer phrase. So you just need to remember that in all these sort of cases of uh, where we have a reference term, we always need to look at the English. It's the English that matters, not the way that we are starting to symbolize it. So what we want to do is we want to go back to the English. And in that case, always means, always refers to the last case or the last condition, clause, whatever you want to conceive of it, in English. So what was the last thing I said in English before I said in that case? If you look closely at the statement, it's I take a nap. And that is the last thing stated in the English language. So when I symbolize it, I need to pick out that one. And I take a nap is the atomic letter P. So this should really be symbolized as P arrow R. That's how we do and in that case.
Remember, it's the English language that we need to look at, not the way that we have started logically symbolizing it. We've looked at some oddities of the English language just to help us so that we, we encounter more sort of everyday natural uh, speaking. We have the ability to, to symbolize it and make sense and understand what's going on. Always remember that I will not be deliberately trying to trick anyone in these cases, so uh, I'm not looking to uh, make things ambiguous and uh, sort of give you sort of difficult test questions, but you just need to remember the standard conventions that I've sort of stated here to help make the meaning clear.